Thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar, Learning from the 2021 Survey of State Tax Departments, uh, focusing on our taxation of pass-through entities survey results. Uh, today, I'm Lauren Calandrio, a state tax analyst here at Bloomberg Tax and Accounting, and I'll be moderating our webinar. I'm joined by Bruce Ely, a partner at Bradley Arendt Bolt Cummings, uh, Helen Hecht, Uniformity Counsel at the Multi-State Tax Commission, and Kelvin Lawrence, partner at Dismarn Scholl. Thank you to all of our esteemed presenters for joining us today and for everyone uh, who's listening in. We appreciate you joining us for one of our webinars. During today's webinar, we will be going over uh, a brief description of what the survey is and how we suggest it's best used. Then we'll be looking at nex nexus issues surrounding past entities, uh, sourcing of gain on the disposition of their ownership interest, apportionment of operating income, past serenity level taxes, uh, reporting of federal tax changes with a focus on the new federal partnership reporting rules, and finally, we'll be wrapping it up with composite returns and withholding. Uh, this year's survey was our 21st annual survey and report, and it's grown exponentially over the years. Uh, each year, we send it out to senior state tax department officials in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and New York City. Uh, responses are based on the law as of January 1st, 2021, which is important to keep in mind because even though we publish it later, we do want to give the states a guidepost as to when they can stop their answers so that they're not constantly revising their responses as their laws change. Um, the survey seeks to clarify gray areas in state taxation and is updated annually to address current trends and emerging issues. For example, this year, we added questions asking states about their newly enacted past rent level taxes. Um, our survey uh, coverage on past entities is listed on this slide here. And as you can see, it covers many of the things we'll be discussing today. So I won't go through that list again as I just ran through it all. Um, additionally, we cover a ver wide variety of corporate income tax and sales and use tax issues. Now, after we get the responses from the states, we compile them all into a special report of over 600 pages that includes the participating states' responses to all questions that we ask, as well as footnotes with any additional commentary that they may add. The report is organized by category, which allows you to easily compare the state responses to the same question, rather than having to look at the same question in 50 different sections for the participating states. We also include an analysis of survey results and related trends um, that really features some great insights from our expert practitioners, including many of those on the call today. If you're interested in a free executive summary, you can use the link provided on this slide here. Um, and if you want the full results, you would need to either be a subscriber of Bloomberg Tax and Accounting or sign up for a free demo. Now, when it comes to the survey, as I mentioned, the report is over 600 pages and can be a bit of a beast to get through. So we suggest using it, um, you know, as kind of a starting point when it comes to your research. There's a wealth of information that's included from the states, both in their yes or no answers, as well as their footnotes and commentary. However, this is not official guidance um, and does not carry the weight as, you know, statutes, regulations, or even private letter rulings. We do recommend that an independent analysis of the state's laws is strongly advised. Um, we found with respect to nexus issues, for example, some states lean towards an activity being taxable, even though their statute may not say that. Um, and one reason why maybe that administrators view nexus issues as cumulative and not just one activity as the survey asks them to look at. Uh, the survey is also a great way to determine how state revenue departments are inter interpreting the state's tax laws since they're not the ones passing them. Um, you can also use the survey response and analysis of the results to gain better insight into state tax trends um, and to get a brief primer on what some of these topics are. Um, while we did get great participation this year and we understand that the states are busy um, with competing priorities in our survey may be low, not all states do participate. Notably, New York does not participate um, and neither does Colorado. So we really encourage you to reach out to your tax administrators and ask them to complete the survey and put careful thought into their completion. Um, Bruce, Helen, Kelvin, how do you all use the survey? Hi, uh, Lauren, uh, this is Bruce. I, I uh, use it almost automatically uh, whenever I start a multi-state tax research project because I'd like to see what the states are doing. Uh, and I've used it, frankly, in a couple of cases to contact states where they were giving me one answer by phone. I'm saying, well, your chart says something else. And they would come back and say, oh, well, you know, either that person's 
been fired or uh, yes, you're right. Uh, uh, we gave you the wrong information. So it, it's a great starting point. And, and uh, I, I'm a pack rat. I keep I bet I've kept the last 10 years of these surveys because states and Helen may not admit this, but sometimes states change positions uh, without administrative or judicial uh, statutory authorization. And it's it's uh, always interesting to, to, to find the year where the state goes from no to yes on a nexus issue, for example. So that, that's that's my personal best. I, again, I always put in a plug for the survey. I think it's a great resource, a great resource tool. Calvin, Helen. Yeah, much in the same way as you described, Bruce, I, I tend to use it for spotting trends uh, and evolving issues, looking year over year to how things change. And, and if there's going to be an issue where um, there's not been prior guidance on it, if it's a new and evolving issue, but there is an adjacent issue, something similar that the, uh, the survey does cover, then that may, may offer uh, some insight as to the way not just one state, but all of the states may may look at that particular issue um, in, in a similar context. Yeah. And I agree with that. I agree with both Bruce and Kelvin, but um, I, especially the idea that you can spot trends and emerging issues, I think that makes it uh, really useful. Yeah. Hey, yeah. well, thank you so much. And for those of you who aren't pack rats, I did want to note that uh, we do have electronic copies of every survey. Uh, going back to our very first one in 2000 uh, on the Bloomberg Tax and Accounting website. So even if you either weren't aware of the survey uh, many years ago or can't find your copy, they are available to you. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Bruce to take us away on Nexus issues that pass through NID space. All right. All right. Thanks, Lauren and Emily, my fellow Bozeman fan. Um, and thank you to, to Helen and Kelvin. I mean, it's, uh, they're uh, great friends and great speakers. I especially appreciate Helen jumping on today. Uh, the time of this webinar couldn't be better in a lot of the new MTC partnership tax project uh, that, that Helen is, is somewhat leading as uniformity council. And I will put in a shameless plug for a certain uh, daily tax report inside article written by uh, your other two speakers on on this partnership project where we even called Helen indefatigable and that was meant to be a good thing. Uh, so I'm glad to have Helen here today to talk about this project. This may be one of the first times we had a chance to uh, interview her about uh, where that's going. Uh, I do want to give, a, uh, and I think my fellow speakers would agree, uh, just a caveat. Uh, the, the, the comments we expressed today, the views we expressed today are, are those of our own personal being and not necessarily views that are respect to law firms or the multi-state tax commission. Uh, and I'll give you the first of several warnings. We have more slides than we have time. So there'll be some situations where we just have to breeze through a slide or two, but they're here for you. It's a great reference tool all by itself. So let's jump into the Nexus charts. Um, not a lot of change from the last few years. As I said I, I probably have the last 10 years, but every so often you'll see a state flip from uh, Nexus question of no to, to yes. And uh, there are a couple situations where that's happened in recent years. But just the, the points to make, the first column is an investment and partnership interest, something that I had several years ago. A number of states have a special exemption um, that prevents the state from taxing either the partnership or the partners um, on investment income if it meets certain criteria. For example, 90% of the assets have to be invested in intangible assets, those things. So that's not really reflected in this first question. But you'll see some age old distinctions between uh, general and limited partnership interests here in the second and third columns and similar uh, parallel with LLC interests. And most of the time when I refer to passive entities today, it's going to be to LLC since those are the certainly the most common. Uh, I, one interesting thing was the disregarded uh, interest. You would think that the states would follow check the box and disregard the entity and go straight to the member, but not necessarily, not always. So, and we'll see in the next slide, uh, with Q subs, you have a little different answer in some states with Q subs than with single member LLCs, even though they're both disregarded for at least income tax purposes. Uh, but as you'd expect in that slide, uh, the partnership doing business creates an extra for itself. Bad, no, no brainer there. Interesting, uh, uh, one more state than, than another has said, well, yeah, if it's an LLC, there's even more nexus created. And with, of course, S corps, uh, you would think that'd be parallel to the C Corp uh, doctrine. So again, not a lot of uh, change here from last year, but I just want to 
uh, commend to drill down and look at the particular state's answers, uh, not just the trends itself. But uh, again, you'll, sometimes you'll be surprised. Let's go over to one of the hottest topics in the past entity space these days. Um, and Kelvin's going to take the lead on this. I think that uh, we can see it's hot by virtue of the number of cases that are coming out on this issue, as well as again, uh, the new MTC partnership tax project Helen will delve into later. So Kelvin, take it away. Thanks, Bruce. I appreciate it. As I'm sure many of you have witnessed in recent years, as the baby boom generation retires, many of them are retiring and selling their ownership interests in their business. And, and this has led to significant income events for these former business owners and caught the attention of state departments of revenue. And the Commerce Clause and the Due Process Clause place constraints on the ability of these states to tax this income. But in many instances, the doctrines developed for corporate taxpayers don't really map well to individuals. And this can lead to some interpretive ambiguity that both the states and taxpayers are using to their advantage. Historically, states have treated the sale of an equity interest in a past entity by a non-resident individual as income from intangible personal property by the state, taxable by the state's, um, the resident, the individual's state of domicile, assuming the uh, property didn't have a business situs in the state. And for corporate taxpayers, this often turned an application of the Supreme Court's precedents applying the unitary business principle. In recent years, however, states have increasingly sought to tax non-resident individual and out-of-state corporate income uh, from, from sales of pass-through entity interest as a portionable income in one form or another. Uh, one example you may recognize was the 2016 Ohio Supreme Court decision in Corrigan v. Testa, uh, which addressed an Ohio statute that requires any person owning a 20% or greater equity voting interest in a pass-through entity over a three-year period to apportion the income from the sale of an interest in that PTE using the entity's average apportionment factors for that three-year period. Um, in Corrigan, the Ohio Supreme Court held that the due process clause prevented the state from taxing the income uh, who wasn't uh, of an individual who wasn't actively involved in the conduct of a business of the business. And the um, activity at issue uh, was the owner's sale of his interest, uh, which didn't involve seeking the benefits and protections of the state. Uh, and in contrast to, um, to, to the receipt of distributive share income, which did. Uh, and granted, this wasn't uh, a, a destruction of the statute in general, stri striking down the statute in general. Uh, it was an as-applied challenge, not invalidated. So the, the court held open the possibility that the state could be constitutionally applied to different facts. And as a result, this case highlights two of the common distinctions in whether dispositions of equity interest can be taxed. The first, whether the interest uh, disposed of is an active interest, typically a managing or general partner uh, or LLC uh, interest, and whether it's a passive interest, a limited partner or non-managing member interest. And then the second is whether the state requires there to have been a unitary relationship between the owner and the entity sold. Uh, and as it relates to the first of these two distinctions on, on this slide you're seeing here, uh, the survey asks whether your state imposes income tax on the gain recognized by the disposition of an out-of-state corporation's managing ownership interest of a pass-through entity doing business in the state, and also whether your state imposes income tax on the gain recognized by the disposition of an out-of-state corporation's limited ownership interest of a pass-through entity doing business in the state. 30 states said uh, that they would tax the corporation's sale of a managing interest with another four states saying it depends and another two of the 12 arizona and virginia giving no response but providing commentary that suggests that even in these situations it depends so unsurprisingly uh, states are largely in agreement uh, as it comes to the managing uh, uh, ownership interest question but interestingly four states changed their response when the question was asked with respect to limited interests. California, Illinois, and Kentucky changed their answers from yes uh, on the sale of a managing interest to it depends or no response, offering some commentary on the no response with respect to the sale of limited partner interests or limited interests. Uh, and in the cases of California and Illinois, their responses suggested this might depend on whether the under the state's law, the gain would be considered uh, business income or non-business income. Uh, in addition, as it relates to the sale of managing interests, eight of the states offer different responses for out-of-state corporations disposing of an interest as opposed to non-resident individuals. Uh, Indiana and North Carolina changed from yes uh, to an answer that indicated that they would follow the federal treatment, suggesting that they would treat uh, IRC Section 338H10 elections as asset transfers at the state level. 
North Dakota indicated that it would depend on whether the owner was engaged in the business of selling businesses. And Montana and Pennsylvania provided no response for individuals, while Wisconsin, in a show of surprising taxpayer friendliness, indicated that they would not tax non-resident individuals on sales of managing ownership interests. And again, I, I, I caveat that by saying refer to the state's own law, uh, not just the responses to these uh, to these questionnaires necessarily, um, to, to, to make sure you have certainty around these issues. Arizona changed its answer from it depends for corporate owners to yes for individuals. Maine reported it would depend on whether the interest is a partnership or an S-corp interest, taxing partnership interest sales, but not S-corp stock sales. So the more nuanced uh, application to corporate owners as opposed to individual owners in these two states may reflect the application of the unitary business principle to corporate ownership. Let me turn the slide here. Uh, we'll see that the application of the unitary business principle to pass through entities was the focus for uh, several uh, sets of questions in the, in the 2021 survey. All right, are we on that um, unitary slide next? Right. And so with respect to the disposition of a managing ownership interest, the survey asked whether your, your state imposes income tax and again recognized by the disposition of state corporation, out of state corporations, uh, managing ownership interest in a pass through entity doing business in the state when the pass through entity and the corporation comprise a unitary business and similarly phrase the question with respect to one that's non unitary. Um, 30 states said they would tax the sale of a managing interest and a PTE corporation when they're unitary, while 27 said they would tax the sale of a managing interest when the PTE and corporation were non-unitary. Interestingly, that's not just a simple decline in three states, but it was a net decline of three states. Five of them changed their answers from yes to it depends or no response, that is Connecticut, Illinois, Kentucky, Montana, and Pennsylvania, while two, Oklahoma and Vermont, change their answers from not applicable to no response on the first question to yes on the sale where the managing interest is non-unitary. So a significant number of states recognize the complexity of these issues and how the application of these principles is far from uniform. Only one state, Tennessee, indicated that it would not tax the gain on the sale to a corporate owner. Um, but this is only in the specific circumstance it noted uh, when the corporation was not filing franchise and excise tax returns in the state and the pass-through entity uh, was filing these returns on a separate entity basis. If yeah. the pass-through entity is a general partnership, Tennessee indicated, then the corporation would be subject to the franchise and excise tax and the state would tax the gain. So there's widespread taxation by states of the corporate gain on the sale of managing interest as in, uh, in an entity that's part of a unitary business. Well, uh, tell me, this, Bruce, why, how come, I mean, yeah, 27 states saying they would tax the dispositions of a managing ownership interest, even if the PT and the corporation were not unitary. I mean, we're going to get into some cases in a minute, but where does that come from? I mean, what, what, what law are they reading? Right. And it gets even worse in the context of the limited uh, partner ownership yeah, uh, interest yeah. in, in, in the case of a unitary business, uh, where there they said that they tax the gain, uh, even if it's a limited partner interest in a in a non in a unitary business. Twenty nine states indicated they tax the sale of a limited interest if it was unitary with a drop off of only one state, Connecticut, uh, when the sales are moving from managing unitary interest to limited unitary interest. Uh, and then comparing sales of unitary versus non-unitary limited interest, 25 states said they would tax non-unitary limited interest sales. Yeah, Lauren, move mm -hmm. to the next slide, please. Yeah, with another eight there saying that it depends uh, or that uh, suggesting that in the comments that they might. So, so this large number of states unequivocally uh, indicating that they would tax non-unitary limited interest really stands out, even to me. It's shocking that this many states are unafraid of really pushing the boundaries of the Supreme Court's precedents. And however, the last few years of this, particularly uh, in, in the Idaho Supreme Court's decision in Noel Industries, uh, which I've noted here uh, and provide a highlight of where the taxpayer uh, disposed of its entire 78.5 five four percent interest in an operating subsidiary uh and and the state uh sought to tax the income uh but the idaho supreme court um uh rebuffed that effort finding 
that uh, there, there wasn't substantial mutual interdependence between the, the founder uh, and, and uh, the entity and, and the operating entity. Um, and uh, the, although the Idaho State uh, Tax Commission filed a petition for writ of certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court, that was denied on February 22nd, 2021. And if you look back at the survey, Idaho provided no response to all of the survey <laughs> questions sent on these issues. Now, let me jump in there. Helen, uh, MTC co-counsel joined in that cert petition. What was the reasoning there? You remember? I, it was not you. I will not blame you for that. It was not well, Bruce, Bruce Ford. It was another gentleman whose name I cannot recall. Well, uh, I think it was Brian Hamer. But um, we. Uh, but I think I signed off on that brief as well as other counsel here. So, um, you know, the it's interesting. This case not only raised the question of the partnership, um, and whether or not the sale of the interest in the partnership could be taxed to the owner who was out of state uh, on, an, uh, on an apportioned basis using the partnership's factors. But there was an intervening holding company. And as you know, Bruce, these holding company issues have come up in other contexts as well. Does the holding oh, yeah. company essentially break the unitary connection between the owner, who was also the founder of this uh, partnership, this LLC, um, simply because there's now this intervening holding company. And, of course, the holding company it seems to have been imposed because the owner was contemplating um, a selling part of his interest. So um, so that's obviously an issue that's going to impact the states um, on, a, on, a broad, on a broad basis. Yeah, and that's, I must admit that's fairly common state tax planning. I won't put that in writing, but, you know, not, not unheard of, I'll say. All right. Well, um, yeah. so Kevin, let's let's uh, we got some other cases. Even yeah. More. And so uh, Minnesota and Yam Special Holdings, again, a similar structure there involving a disposition of 71.39 uh, percent interest in a holding company. Uh, and, and there uh, the state uh, won the day, so to speak, with a gain from the entity being treated as a portionable because it was part of a unitary business. Uh, and the unitary uh, business test was part of Minnesota statute. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, in this case also, Minnesota indicated that it would tax the gain uh, in all of the survey questions asked regarding these issues. Uh, an interesting case that we've been tracking over the last couple of years is at the uh, New York City level. This is the matter of Goldman Sachs Peters Hill Fund Offshore Holdings Corp. Um, this is um, the, these, this case and the next case that I'll mention uh, uh, VAS holdings and investment represent the furthest extension, in my opinion, of the state's assertion of the power to tax income from the sale of uh, pass-through entities. These two cases can each be thought of sort of as uh, anti-Corrigan cases, uh, casting aside the unitary business principle and having a very charitable view of their respective jurisdictions' contributions to the value of uh, interest in the entities sold. Now, in Goldman, uh, the uh, interest that was disposed of was a 9.9% interest in an LLC that was doing business in the city. Uh, and uh, the petitioner there, through the ownership of a limited partnership interest, uh, indirectly owned a passive minority interest, which was taxed uh, for federal income tax purposes uh, as a partnership. And why I say this was an extreme case here is because the party stipulated uh, that neither the petitioner corporation uh, and the ultimate LLC nor the subsidiary uh, limited partnership in the LLC were part of a unitary business. Uh, at the lower level, the administrative law judge nevertheless determined that the city could tax uh, the gain from the sale of the corporation's interest in the LLC consistent with the due process clause and the commerce clause because the LLC's value had appreciated as a result of the benefits, protections, and opportunities that New York City had provided it. Uh, and, and essentially that holding was upheld at the tax uh, appeals tribunal level. Uh, it, it, it really looked at um, re rejecting the position that the LLC interest should be treated like corporate stock. And it reasoned that the absence of the corporation's legal rights in the LLC's property was irrelevant to the question of whether the corporation was taxable on the LLC's income. Due process, it said, uh, required only notice and fair warning, which the corporation satisfied by filing tax returns uh, on its distributor share income from the LLC's business. Uh, the tribunal at one point shows remarkable candor, indicating that it was uh, in 
or at least suggesting that it was in part motivated by the fact that the corporation, uh, that if the corporation were not the taxpayer in this case, then the income derived from New York City would entirely escape taxation. Uh, and this conclusion is driven, it appears, by the result, not necessarily following the, the rules laid down uh, in, in, in the precedents, but finding a way to tax this income. Um, the, the tribunal concluded that the corporation's statutory entire net income uh, had to be apportioned uh, using the apportionment ratios there. And, uh, and, and, it, and it said that uh, if the petitioner's investment business produced income from investments other than the entity, uh, that uh, income from those investments wouldn't be apportionable to the city because it wouldn't be unitary with the LLC's business. In other words, that the unitary business principle's only function is to uh, prevent uh, based this largely on, on uh, allied signal, not at the Supreme Court level, but at the New York State, New York City levels. Uh, there, there were decisions related to Allied Signal that allowed them to tax this income and leaned heavily on, on the uh, familiar uh, international harvester uh, case uh, out of the U.S. Supreme Court from many years ago. And so New York City um, uh, shares with Washington, D.C. the honor of being uh, the, two of the cities included in this survey. And unfortunately, like Idaho, New York City did not address any of these questions in its response to the survey. A uh, similar case in, in Massachusetts there um, with uh, VAS Holdings and Investments. Yeah, moving on there, thank you. Um, the uh, Massachusetts App Appellate Tax Board uh, affirmed a personal income tax and corporation excess ex assessments against the S Corporation sale of its entire 50% interest in an LLC that was uh, taxed as a partnership. The backstory being that these two entities, uh, an Illinois entity and uh, a Massachusetts entity, uh, created a, a new partnership entity in which they both invested uh, and essentially allowed the Illinois entity's owners to uh, seemingly retire with the Massachusetts entity uh, taking over uh, the business and uh, taking responsibility for much of its uh, operations. And uh, after there was a, a sale of the entity, uh, its, its income was uh, taxed here by Massachusetts on the basis that it, it accrued as a result of these two years between when these two entities joined and when it was ultimately sold uh, because the talent and skill of the Massachusetts personnel uh, running the business and operating it in Massachusetts uh, was responsible for, for the um, the increase in value and, and thus uh, the benefits and protections of Massachusetts uh, were offered to the entity and allowed the state to constitutionally tax that income. Like, hey, doesn't, doesn't this sound like the New York Tax Tribunal, it, Kelvin? It, it certainly does. It, it really echoes it. They're again, leaning heavily on that uh, 1944 decision in International Harvester v. Wisconsin and, and drawing a distinction between the unitary business principle, which it sees as an investor-based uh, apportionment methodology and the um, investee apportionment, which it finds uh, is constitutional in, in this context. And so uh, the, in a survey, Massachusetts answered, it depends to all of the questions relating to gain on sale and cited its, its uh, tax guide for pass-through entities on its own website. Uh, and, 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 you know, that uh, in turn cites to regulations uh, for pass through entity withholding and apportionment of income for non-resident individu individuals and corporations. So um, what the survey here is showing us and what these cases are showing us is a definite trend uh, to a greater and greater assertion, even in states where there hasn't been case law yet. Uh, on these issues uh, of, of, of states seeking to tax this income as the baby boomer generation retires. Well, Kelvin, in the line of Paul Frankel, I will point out that both these cases are on appeal. Uh, the mm -hmm. interesting part about VAS, as you and I have talked about, is the the taxpayer applied for direct appeal to the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, bypassing their intermediate court. And the Supreme Judicial Court granted that application very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but, but part of that, I think, was the Massachusetts DOR, to their credit, did not oppose the application and indeed said that, well, you know, this is a case of first impression in Massachusetts, and we admit that this investee apportionment theory is the minority view, which I think is clearly the case. Uh, and the ATB had cited uh, as of authority this uh, the New York Tax Tribunal ruling in Goldman Sachs. So 
uh, we're watching this case closely. Um, uh, again, because I think that there's sort of parallel between Massachusetts and New York, although I think this case, uh, again, because there's a more clean slate in Massachusetts, this case may be the better one to, to find out what the real answer is about this investee versus investor apportionment. Uh, Helen, any thoughts on that? I know that ties in with your, uh, with your uh, project. I'll just say that, of course, this issue was re was raised in Mead West Faco and, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and our brief in Mead West Faco, the multi-state tax commission's brief, um, actually urged the court to go ahead and find that even though uh, the income couldn't be taxed by Illinois on the basis, uh, I mean, they agreed this is not a unitary uh, relationship. If, if it couldn't be taxed on that basis, it could still be apportioned using the investees factors. And of course, the court said, well, that'd be great, but it wasn't argued below, and so we're not going to address it. And also recognized, in its opinion, that the uh, that there were states at that time. So what is this, 12 years ago? Um, there were states at that time that had uh, this rule in place, and that was one of the things that made the court say, we're going to, we're not going to try and address this sort of as a as an aside to the issues that have been raised here, um, because it's too important an issue uh, already already in play with some of these states. And so I think that's, I, I think inevitably this is likely to get back up to the Supreme Court for that reason. Yes, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Well, let's move on. Uh, Helen, you wanted to take the lead on the apportionment of operating income, so let me turn that over to you. Sure, and you know there's a there's a classic statement in the Bloomberg materials that uh, that I often quote. Um, it describes the partnership taxation rules of most states as quote underdeveloped. Um, <laughs> I think that word is probably charitable when it comes to most states, not all states, but too many. Um, and I think that the problem is that uh, many of our rules. I think Kelvin uh, mentioned this have been developed in the corporate income tax con uh, context, and it's so much easier when you're talking about the, the same entity that you're taxing um, versus the much more complicated pass-through system in which we have to apply these rules for partnership tax purposes. Um, so as I talk about the apportionment of operating income, which is the meat and potatoes of partnership taxation, I just think it's important to recognize that while there may be a logic to how the rules might work, uh, many states don't have explicit or detailed rules for every case. Uh, and of course, part of the problem is that uh, there are a lot of different cases. Uh, so here's where I think the complexity becomes apparent. Those fam familiar with the state taxation of corporate income know that the states make a distinction between business and non-business income. And the reason we do that is because the U.S. Supreme Court has said that corporations can apportion business income using that corporation's apportionment factors, whereas apportionment uh, might not be fairly related to non-business income, so we're requiring that it be sourced using some other method. So the question is, what is the nature of the income uh, and how do you determine it? Uh, and is it does it have to be determined in the hands of the taxpayer or in the case of partnerships, is it determined at the entity level? Uh, and that was the question that was asked by the survey, and a number of states said that the question is determined at the partnership level. Uh, and then some states said that the question is determined at the partner level. So you see almost uh, a split here uh, with a lot of states that, um, that didn't respond and include those states. But here, uh, here are the answers to the questions of those that responded. And you'll notice that uh, there were a handful of states that said either both or it depends. Um, now, if you ask me, I would say that it depends is the right answer. There are actually a couple of uh, questions here that are interrelated. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to tease them apart. And the first is, what kind of partner are we talking about? Because corporations and individuals are taxed differently, and in particular, individuals don't typically have apportionment factors, whereas corporations do. Uh, so, for an individual partner, you're typically talking about apportionment at the partnership level. Um, but when it comes to corporations, the income can be apportioned at the partnership level or at the partner level or some combination. Uh, and that means that the business non business distinction may need to be made at both levels. Um, but the answer is it depends again because it's dependent on whether the partner uh, is an individual or a corporation. And of course, that's not the end of it. 
there are things that are unique to partnerships, and one of those things is called a guaranteed payment. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, um, these are some of the questions that were asked about, or back one slide. Oh, no, yep, there you go. Um, these are some of the questions that were asked specifically about guaranteed payments. My suspicion is that there are a number of states that haven't thought hard about this yet. Um, uh, guaranteed payments, as I use that term, I'm just talking about anything that's properly accounted for under subchapter K as a reduction of income to the partnership. So distributive shares don't reduce income, they just distribute. But guaranteed payments do reduce income. So a partner that receives something that's treated as a guaranteed payment is typically going to have provided the partnership with something for which the partner is paid, um, and it's and the partner's paid regardless of the partnership's income. Uh, so then the question is, do you apply a different rule for when a guaranteed payment is business or non-business income? Uh, and that may very well determine how that uh, guaranteed payments payment is sourced. So it matters, right? So for example. Uh, assume the partnership's operating primarily in state X, but has agreed to pay one of the partners for services that are performed primarily in state Y. Um, should that guaranteed payment be treated as business income and apportioned by the partnership using its factors? Or should it be sourced entirely to state Y? And, and does it really depend entirely on the business, non-business nature of that payment? Or is there some other partnership uh, specific issue that's at play here uh, that we just haven't uh, had the opportunity to address fully. Um, so these are the questions that were asked by the survey, but I honestly think many states have just not grappled with these questions fully. Uh, yes. So we'll see some evolution in this, I think, over the next few years. Well, Helen, is this um, part of your uh, is is this part of your partnership tax project then to try to absolutely. develop some uniform? Okay. Yes. Absolutely, and I and I appreciate the, just the question because just the question in the survey demonstrates that some states are thinking about it, uh, and practitioners are asking the question, and so the fact that it's there, I think, uh, helps to prompt us to think about it a little. It does harder. I mean, uh, I mean off the record that these these questions came from a forty state survey that our law firm did for a company that did business with partnerships in forty five states and. We had the indelible opportunity of calling each state DOR or hiring local counsel to get mm -hmm. answers on these things. And uh, then and then we put the survey out, we being Bloomberg, and in several cases, we received different answers than what we'd received earlier, six months earlier, uh, with our direct contacts. So sometimes it's just who you talk to at the Department of Revenue, or as you say, they really hadn't thought about it too much. And then all of a sudden, they, they have, and uh, maybe they put more time into it. So... Um, Right. I, it, it's right. a good question. It is something that I, I do commend to uh, to your project. Yes. No. I, I like I say. I I just appreciate knowing that other people think this is an important issue, uh, and that there may need to be further development of the yeah. of the yeah of the policy. So I think yep. that's great. Yep. Um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, one reason why I think the states haven't grappled fully with these kinds of questions is that they rely generally on their state apportionment rule, including the Uniform Division of Income for Tax Purposes, or UDITPA. Now, that act was designed for corporations as well, and it works pretty well for other forms of businesses, but it doesn't address some issues that come up only in the partnership context, and guaranteed payments is one, but others involve primarily tiered partnership structures, and I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, on this slide, we see the responses to the questions concerning uh, whether partnership income is apportioned at the partnership level or at the partner level. And again, there were some states that said one or the other, although most said partnership income is apportioned at the partnership level. Uh, and then we have states that say yes or both, or it depends. And again, I think the answer is it depends. Uh, this question uh, is asked in the context, I think, of corporate partners. But even in that context, if the general rule of the state is that business income uh, in the hands of the partnership is apportioned at the partnership level, then that may be the answer, whether the partner is a corporate or individual partner. But I think many states would say that if the partnership is owned by members of a unitary group and they hold a controlling interest, for example, uh, then 
the factors of the partnership and the income are rolled up and included. So states might interpret the answer as apportioning at the partner level uh, this method of rolling up the partnership's factors, even though that's really sort of a combination approach. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So so it's hard to know, but I suspect that uh, that some of these uh, yes to both really mean um, well we use both the partnership and the partners information uh, for sourcing. Mm -hmm. um, even if the partnership income comes from a partnership where the corporate partner doesn't hold a majority interest, it could be apportioned at the partner level, assuming that it's uh, business income to that corporate partner. So uh, you have to be careful about some of these distinctions uh, and what they mean, obviously. Um, and it might be apportionable in that case uh, because it's just, you know, business income, operating income, um, and and not uh, purely investment income. Um, yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, no, that's the easier test. You're right. Um, but uh, yeah, again, that's and it's a lead up to your your latest um, project that that Kelvin and I have written about and are, are watching closely along with. Steve Lodicek and many others in the PTE realm. And, and the reason it caught our attention is because it has such a, a wide um, scope of, of, of work. And right. first thing Kelvin and I thought was, my gosh, how many years will it take for mm -hmm. for this to come to fruition? Because you, you're really biting off a lot. I'm not saying I'm not saying you're biting off more than you can chew. I'm just saying you're biting off a lot uh, yeah. in an area. Well, you know, where you don't have many states that really have developed partnership tax law, right? Right. You know, and I and I, I take inspiration from our history because there was a time when we didn't have a UDIPA and uh, the states got together and helped to develop those rules. And so I, I take some inspiration from the fact that we've had big projects like this uh, in the past. And uh, what I what I think merits taking this comprehensive approach to this particular issue is the fact that these issues are all related. Um, you know, we had this experience, frankly, when we were looking at some of these cases that uh, Kelvin talked about earlier and, and the questions that the courts were grappling with and uh, what's the exact relationship between uh, these ideas and how does it matter. Um, and I don't think there are black and white rules necessarily, even in the in the corporate context. Obviously, um, there are some things. You know, uh, we talked about Mead West Faco. The court left that issue open. hasn't uh, had the opportunity to come back to it uh, since uh, since it uh, made its sort of cryptic remarks in that decision. So uh, we're we're sort of in the same boat everybody else is uh, in trying to think through these things. But I want to make sure. Uh, in the work that we do here at the commission, that we don't just take a little bit of this and try and address one particular narrow issue and then find down the road that we've got some disconnect or some uh, inconsistency between what we do in one place and uh, and what's happening someplace else. So I do think there are relationships that we have to be conscious of and, and sort of a framework um, uh, overarching framework for a lot of these issues. Um, yeah, and and Helen, you, I want to uh, commend to our I'm readers. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I just want to go ahead, Lauren. Go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say, in the interest of time, did we want to jump ahead to the example that you laid out that I think really kind of sets the stage for this very well? Sure. sure right. that's jump in there, Helen. So yeah, if you'll go to the if you go to the slide with the example on it, um, right. So the point here being that um, different different situations raise the possibility for a number of different outcomes. And here's an example. This is actually a really simple example, but I I know that if you're if you like unlike me haven't gone through the numbers, um, it it probably looks a little overwhelming. But the point of this is that even in a simple structure, a small partnership structure, where you have just a few partners, if you have more than one tier, and if you have folks that are spread out in different jurisdictions, um, you can have wildly different results depending on how you go about apportioning 
the income of a particular partnership. So in this example, um, you can see on the uh, left-hand side, the structure as well as the sales, uh, assuming a one single sales factor apportionment um, on the on the left-hand side, and then the results, depending on how you apportion on the right-hand side, whether you use just the partnerships, uh, just P1's factors, whether you combine P1 and its uh, tiered partners, or whether you apportion at the uh, partner level, uh, or in the case of the corporate partner, whether you roll up the factors and the, and the income, you get wildly different results, ranging from zero uh, percent to 100 percent and things in between. So that just goes to show you that in these more complicated situations, um, there need to be detailed rules, um, both for uh, taxpayers and practitioners uh, and for the states to say, here's how we're going to do it. And it may not be a perfectly uh, a symmetrical uh, outcome in every case, but as long as we've got a little more uh, confidence in what the outcome is going to be, uh, I think it would be better for everybody concerned. Yes. So that's this is sort of the, like I said, the meat and potatoes of what we're trying to do in our project. Well, Helen, let me put in a plug for your uh, issue outline. It was just posted on your website this morning. I believe you have a conference call here in a minute with this working group. It's a uh, Current as of August 10, it's a really good read, especially uh, for those who are somewhat of a novice in the in state taxation and partnerships. I, I, it's uh, what, 10, 11 pages, I guess. It's a great reading, and I suspect that you had a, a large hand in drafting it, but I think it's a right. good read for anybody. We're going to develop this as a group, and uh, and it will it will get bigger and longer and more detailed as we go <laughs> as we go forward. As so, the years yeah. go by. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, Kel Kelvin, we are moving fast. So on to PT taxes, my friend. Agreed. I'll, I'll move quickly through this one. So as was predicted by many commentators, including Bruce and myself, 2021 witnessed a flurry of legislative acti activity surrounding these taxes intended to circumvent the state and local tax uh, deduction cap that was imposed in the TCJA. Uh, as you can see from the next, the chart of the next slide, 15 states indicate that they have enacted an entity level pass through entity tax here. Eight indicated that their tax is mandatory, while eight indicated that the tax is optional. And you might ask, how's that possible? Totaling 16. Well, that's yeah. because Maryland answered yes to both questions that its tax is mandatory for non residents and optional for residents. Mm -hmm. um, state responses to this question highlight that there were entity level PTE taxes before the TCJA. Um, uh, you might think that there's only one state, Connecticut, that's en enacted a truly mandatory entity level tax uh, in response to the TCJA, um, but there were others uh, that predated uh, the TCJA, such as uh, DC and New York City's unincorporated business taxes, Kentucky's uh, limited liability entity tax, the Massachusetts corporate excise tax on S corps, uh, New Hampshire's business and profits tax and business enterprise taxes, and the uh, Tennessee franchise and excise tax. Um, note also that this chart only uh, speaks with respect to corporate states that impose a corporate income tax. Uh, Ohio in particular doesn't impose a corporate income tax, but it does uh, have a tax at the uh, individual level and a PTE tax in a rather complicated structure that that um, is no doubt going to be the source of uh, much controversy in the future, I hope. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and uh, you know, I've got a couple of slides here about the background of the, the TCJA cap uh, and, and some of the responses to that. And I'll leave, commend that to your reading later. Um, but all to say that note, IRS notice 2020-75 indicated that the IRS is going to propose regulations um, uh, allowing uh, these uh, uh, pass-through entity tax structures to reduce uh, income uh, for, for these entities for federal purposes. And many uh, widely consider this to be the blessing that uh, they had awaited for these types of tax structures. And, and, it, and it put states off to the races, uh, so to speak, to adopt these taxes. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, you see here uh, in a helpful map that was created by the AI CPA and is available on their website. Uh, 11 more states have uh, PTE taxes that are or are set to become law. Uh, Oregon's is not reflected here in the chart because it uh, uh, was signed uh, after this, this chart um, uh, was made. And so that brings the total up to 18 now. In Illinois, there is a salt cap bill that's passed both chambers and is awaiting the governor's signature. 
Uh, if the governor doesn't sign, my understanding is that it would become law 60 days after submission, which would be August 27th. If the governor vetoes it, I understand there's adequate support to get it passed. Massachusetts has been back and forth uh, between the governor and the legislature uh, two times, I understand. Now, uh, the, dis the, 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 the disagreement there being that the governor wants a full 100 percent credit for the tax uh, and the, uh, the legislature wanting only a 90 percent tax uh, credit. Uh, for those who've paid at the entity level. Uh, in the past, this was uh, perhaps thought to be a way to prevent this from getting a similar result as uh, the charitable deductions, that it not be treated as a quid pro quo at the federal level. Here, however, it's being driven, I believe, by the governor's uh, expressed desire to provide um, greater relief to business owners uh, coming out of the pandemic. In North Carolina, both chambers have passed theirs, and it's in uh, conference committee ironing out the differences. Pennsylvania's referred theirs to committee, uh, and the legislature doesn't adjourn until December, so likely something to result there. And interestingly, in Michigan, two different there. In 2018, Republican Governor Rick Snyder uh, vetoed it over concern that it wouldn't be upheld by the IRS. Uh, and now, even after the IRS's guidance in uh, notice 2020-75, Democratic Governor uh, Gretchen Whitmer vetoed the proposal, uh, citing the cost of implementation of the tax, the benefit to the state's wealthiest residents, and that it may never be realized if Congress is successful in uh, relieving the cap. Um, moving on to the next slide, I've given kind of an overview here of some of the states breaking them out into uh, different features, uh, and I'm just going to discuss that, but I'll commend that to your reading separately. Likewise, here uh, for 2021, we've seen a number of these taxes enacted, some more different than others. California, in particular, uh, not allowing the election of their partnership owners or if the corporate owners are membership uh, are members of a combined group, uh, and and distinctions here in the type of the election. So, for example, there it must be an annual election, irrevocable for the single tax year, uh, and and the uh, credit in California being at 9.3% per, 9 uh, of the, the uh, qualified net income that's paid uh, at the entity level, um, it, it can be taken as a credit, but unlike in many states, it's not a refundable credit. Uh, it has to be carried forward and can be carried forward for up to five years. Um, some considerations to think about here, whether in making the election, uh, I assume you need a chart like Helen's there uh, to, to break it out for you, um, but whether the, the, the state requires unanimous consent or majority vote or opt-in, uh, whether the election needs to be made annually or if it's binding and irrevocable, if the election's made late, uh, do you get credit for estimated taxes that were, were paid uh, previously, or is there a waiver for interest in penalties now that there are late estimates under the PTE tax? Uh, and there may be also issues, uh, you know, lost, uh, things lost as a result of having made the election, such as the inability to offset losses and gains from affiliated PTEs. Uh, the inability of individual owners to use uh, personal tax uh, attributes or, or, or credits available to them uh, to reduce their tax liability, and added complexity when when you have um, the partnership audit rules considered. Kentucky's response in the survey indicated that uh, although Kentucky hasn't adopted an entity level PTE tax, it, it did address uh, the state's uh, uh, pass through entity audit rules, uh, which which it considers mandatory uh, and, and allows for assessment at the entity level. Like. Likewise, um, you know, as I mentioned with respect to California, can, can you make the election? Uh, Wisconsin, some other issues there related to the tax rate may not be beneficial for all those who make the election. And uh, dealing with the other states tax credit, but what's, what's euphemistically refer there is for the um, credit for taxes paid. Uh, does the state's uh, the, the, the state of resident of the individual owners allow for credit for entity level taxes imposed at other states. If not, the owners risk potentially a, a marginal tax rate savings at the federal level, but a dollar for dollar reduction in the tax credit at the state level. And that's especially pronounced in states that offer only a partial credit for the PTE tax. Um, you know, note there to, to um, Connecticut. So uh, is there a, a federal benefit or detriment to certain owners? For example, if you, you've got a loss entity, um, you know, it's really not going to benefit you uh, uh, necessarily. Um, and and uh, then the state treatment of tax exempt owners, for example, New Jersey's tax requires uh, the tax base to include those exempt entities, but then requires them to file a refund to get the, the tax paid uh, on their behalf back. 
And, and similarly, uh, you know, uh, some states provide for different credits for corporate owners as opposed to individual owners, and that also needs to be taken into consideration. So, um, you know, at, at, at the state level, there's, there's all sorts of history dealing with the availability of the credit uh, for those who um, pay tax at the entity level. Uh, examples here being in, you know, Kentucky, uh, Ohio, not allowing that credit uh, may, may forebode what, what is going to happen here in, in Ohio. Um, likewise, Al Alabama has a history of having allowed it at some times, but then a legislative amendment may have changed that. Rhode Island allows uh, credit for residents of similar taxes uh, in its PTE tax, uh, and New Jersey has offered informal guidance that it would allow the credit for the Connecticut entity level tax. So there, there's a, a broad uh, disagreement uh, as to what all is going on here. Um, and, and I think uh, and hope that the MTC uh, Uniformity Committee uh, project will help bring some guidance here. And using that as a, as a segue, I'll turn it over to Bruce uh, to address some of the federal partnership audit rules in the MTC's Model Act uh, that, that has uh, been addressing that issue at the state level. Yeah, Thank, thanks, Kelvin. Um, and I, I echo your uh, encouragement to Helen's group to, to take up this OSTC issue. I think that's a critical issue with the, the rise of these PTE taxes. Kevin, I got to put you on the spot. How many of these states will repeal their PTE tax if the salt cap deduction goes away at the end of the <laughs> I'm thinking that might that? be a big fat goose egg right there. Huh? <laughs> you know, there, there are two of them that have an automatic sunset. Uh, two of the new ones, they self-destruct either on a specific date or when the, the federal, you know, 163J uh, provision sunsets. So, but I, I'm with you. I don't think Helen, you may disagree. I don't think any states are going to touch this unless it's already built into the statute. Um, and I think you'll probably see a few more states jump on the bandwagon this year. Well, it was interesting. We had Michael Desmond, uh, who is the ex uh, yeah. chief counsel of the IRS, on a, on a seminar recently. And uh, yes, he is a good guy. And we um, uh, we asked him. You know, he uh, there was an article in State Tax Notes, and there was some other information out there floating around saying, well, you know, this is also useful or could have been useful in the context of the alternative minimum tax. And, of course, TCJ changed that as well, but it also sunsets the changes under TCJA. Mm -hmm. So we asked him, you know, uh, what do you think? Is this something that the IRS would authorize? You know, it's one thing as an authorization for um, – uh, potentially the salt cap, but would it change if the IRS was considering the alternative minimum tax instead? And uh, and he thought, you know, the IRS would probably reconsider. Of course, the IRS uh, has issued proposed uh, guidance, but nothing uh, final. And so uh, I think that's another question. He was also very cautious to say, uh, don't don't assume that if you establish a partnership to try and take advantage of this workaround, that that's going to be respected necessarily by the IRS. So it has to have all the mm. attributes of a, of a true partnership. Yeah. Um, yeah. I saw and, that. And, yeah. So he also, you know, we talked with him as well about these uh, federal changes uh, under the new uh, centralized partnership audit regime. Mm -hmm. And, and we asked him, um, you know, the states are, currently in the process of adopting uh, legislation that will allow them to pick up the state tax on these federal adjustments. And so we're waiting, obviously, not every state, as, as the slides in this next section show, not every state has uh, has yet adopted uh, legislation that would allow them to pick up these changes. Um, the audits are still in the pipeline. Uh, we asked uh, Mr. Desmond. Uh, what did what did he think about the timeline for the IRS and uh, getting some of these audit adjustments finalized? And he thought they were facing a little bit of a learning curve as well. Um, you know, they uh, they were in the process of issuing final regulations up until uh, last year, I guess, or early last year. And so, um, you know, I think there's uh, again been some time delay and. Uh, we see this train coming, but uh, it seems like it's kind of slow moving. And so <laughs> states are are still working on getting legislation in place. Um, if we want to move through the slides to the map that show uh, the states that have acted. Keep going. There, there we go. There we are. 
Helen, let me um, add one thing. We yeah. interviewed we interviewed the uh, acting director of the Pastor Entity Unit uh, a couple months ago, and she said two things that really caught my attention. One is, and they, they used the words very surprised. They were very surprised the number of Pastor Entities that did not opt out that could have. Right. And I saw that. I, right. I, to the next question is, well, why do you think? Well, we refuse to speculate, but, you know, we kind of gleaned from her discussion that a lot of a lot of the pastor entities just missed it you know just didn't know mm. they had the option to opt out or they just didn't check the box or whatever but now you know it's not just the big hedge funds there's a lot of small partnerships and llc's that are going to be subject to these new rules mm -hmm. uh, and, and secondly she said as, as michael did is you know this is ramping up there they've hired a number of so-called partnership auditors uh and uh, we're expecting to see a a, a uh, much heavier audit activity this fall of, of these partnerships. I suspect the IRS will go after the larger ones first. But I, again, back to this map, Hill, I mean, to me, it's kind of a no-brainer that a state would not uh, enact this statute. But what are your thoughts? Well, so, so this is the model uniform law that the MTC drafted along with the AICPA, especially, and, and big shout out to them and to the ABA and cost and TEI and others. Um, and uh, I really do, I have to commend this project as one where people really were collaborating. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the stars just aligned because there were a lot of folks who said, you know, we know states are gonna do something uh, and it needs to work. And we have to telegraph that to our, to our partners so that they know what to expect. We have to put it in partnership agreements and we gotta be prepared for this. Yep. So th there was a lot of, uh, of good faith collaboration on this project and uh, nothing's perfect. So, uh, it, you know, there the way this uh, the way our model works is that uh, at the at the default level, at the at the initial level, uh, the idea is that you amend everything. But we also provide a partnership pays approach uh, that's elective for the partnership. So, and it's also elective for any tier, tiered partners. So that uh, if if the partnership, the audited partnership or any of the tiered partners say, you know, just be easier for us to pay the tax. Okay, then you calculate that tax using the highest rate. You calculate that tax assuming if you don't know better uh, that your indirect partners, tax paying partners are residents in the state. Um, and there are some exclusions for unitary corporate partners uh, are excluded from this partnership pays approach. But I think it's workable. And there's also even a provision that says that um, uh, the partnership can go to the state, to the agency and say, hey, how about if we do it this way? Uh, we've got a unique situation here and we propose to pay the tax this way. So I think it's a workable approach. Um, states are still looking at it to some extent and implementing it. So a number of states that have adopted are now in the process of implementing it. But yeah. uh, if, if you had asked me at the very beginning of all of this, uh, when the IRS was just beginning to uh, to implement it, was this going to go as smoothly as it did? I would have said no, um, <laughs> because it was such a huge, it was such a huge change. Well, I mean, um, it's, it's like herding cats, to, as you say right. on slide 45, and we had to put cost, AICPA, ABA, uh, TIA and MTC all in one room, and uh, it worked out s swimmingly well, I thought. I mean, but just yes, to get did, those groups together, I thought was um, one of my accomplishments of my entire practice, frankly. Uh, well, we couldn't have done it without all of those participants. There was, yeah. not, enough, there was not enough understanding of what would and would not be important to address. And, uh, what was and was not workable in practice. Um, and so we really, I think, came together with a good model. And I think even some even some of the state folks were skeptical and good for them and gave it uh, a pretty thorough review, thinking, well, we got to make sure that this works. Um, but I think what we ended up with is a is a model that most people can look at and say, yeah, this is this this is actually a workable, consistent way of dealing with this so more information in the slides on the yeah. process exactly how it works so yeah thanks helen uh great mm -hmm. job there and you know one thing is, is disappointing me in some states that have enacted parts of this statute is you know one of the things the cost really pushed for was a uniform rar statute um and 
most, I was, maybe it's most, but a number of states have said, no, we'll have a, a we'll follow the uh, Model Act RAR statute for partnership audits, but we want to keep the old one with respect to corporations and individuals. So in a number of states now, you have to look at, depending on who your taxpayer is, your client is, you, have, you got to look at two RAR statutes and, and they both may apply if you have a partnership involving individuals and corporations and that's, and that's that's not a criticism of the model statutes, it's a criticism of the states that didn't adopt the model statute in Moss. I mean, Helen, any thoughts on that? Well, timing is everything. And so, <laughs> one of the, you know, when I wasn't around when we originally drafted the the federal adjustments model, um, I I uh, I think the provisions in that model are great. Uh, I don't have any problems with it, and I don't think that many states really have problems with the provisions. It's just that they already had something different in place. Yeah. And especially when it comes to something like this, not only do states have it in their law and in their regulations and on their forms, but they have it in their systems. And so it's already programmed. And and what changing means, uh, unless you're just changing something simple, uh, oftentimes is, is a change that can have widespread in, uh, implications and maybe even unintended consequences. So I'm hoping that uh, in doing this, uh, people will take another look at some of those provisions and say, "Well, you know, why do we why do we have uh, 90 days instead of 180 days, or why do we why do we think that it's better to have an earlier date for the final determination date?" Yeah. Um, and at least it, at least it gets people to to think about those decisions and whether or not um, they're necessary. Because I, I agree, I think this is one area where uniformity is especially important you know we we sometimes i think uniformity is overrated frankly i think sometimes it you know states have different rates and they have different taxes and uh, more power to them let me but jot that down way. uniformity is overrated <laughs> helen Hayes. let me write some, that down sometimes sometimes <laughs> but this is not one of those times this is one where i think everybody would benefit from more uniformity absolutely I agree. practice your side with I that Bruce, uh, why don't you give us like the bird's eye view, two minute summary of what's going on with composite returns and withholding to okay. wrap us up. Okay, good. Well, let's move on uh, quickly in the few minutes we have remaining to composite returns and non-resident withholding. Uh, the, the chart, and, and let me again refer you to the, the uh, slides that uh, Helen and Cost have put together on the MTC model statute. Very good. Good reference material. All right, closing out um, slide 54. Um, I think it's or whatever the number may be in the new deck. You have a number of states that require composite returns, but then you have a number of states more so that have that option. Uh, my home state of Iowa just enacted uh, Senate Photo 608, uh, so they're going to have a composite return uh, requirement effective 1 1 um, So uh, you know, you're, I think. You're up to about 38 or 39 states that have some form of composite return or non-resident withholding, or in Alabama's case, both. Uh, so again, you have to look at each state statute, and they're not alike, unfortunately. Now, the interesting part is going to be seeing how these dovetail with PTE taxes. I mean, uh, if you elect PTE status, are you out of composite return mode? Uh, that's that seems to be the leaning of some states, but we don't see a lot of guidance yet on on where the states are going to go with that. Uh, I wanted to close, uh, and, and Kelvin and I wrote an article about this case, um, Kelvin mostly, called Black Eagle Minerals at the end of the, uh, end of the slide deck. It's one of those rare challenges to a composite return statute, and the Alabama Administrative Law Judge had ruled twice on the constitutionality of this statute and said, it's okay, Commerce Clause, Due Process Clause, it's, it's okay. Um, but the taxpayer came in with the Alabama Tax Tribunal and, and tried again, frankly, saying that, well, it discriminates um, against non-resident partners since the statute only applies to non-resident partners. You only need a composite return when there are non-residents involved. Um, the, the Tax Tribunal uh, hunted on that because it was a facial challenge to the statute. So it went to the Montgomery County Circuit Court, which eventually ruled uh, against the taxpayer, uh, in part, frankly, because the judge was involved with one of those administrative law division cases, which you won't see or hear that, but uh, the same, the circuit judge had been elected, and so I, I kind of guessed where that case would go. 
um, when it was presented to him. So he ruled in favor of the state and basically on presumption of constitutionality grounds. But he said, oh, by the way, this looks like a complimentary tax doctrine. Oregon waste would apply. So the taxpayer then appeals to the Alabama Court of Civil Appeals. And eventually uh, the Court of Civil Appeals affirms the circuit court saying, again, this is just a level playing field concept. We're putting residents, non-residents and their distributive shares in equal uh, tax situation. And again, the OSTC provision is what the equalizer was. And they're citing an Oklahoma statute requiring oil and gas operators to withhold income tax and royalty payments. Uh, the taxpayer applied for rehearing, uh, denied. Uh, the taxpayer did not apply to the Supreme Court for certiorari. Uh, again, it's just a case of watch. I think part of it, the, the court probably was thinking, you know, if I rule this statute in constitutional, I'm affecting at least 37 or 38 other states. I think that was that may have been one of the rubs. Kelvin, any parting thoughts on that case? No, I think you covered it pretty well. I mean, the um, the mandatory nature is what really sets it apart here. And uh, and I think the survey kind of broke out the distinctions between those that have the mandatory and, and the elective taxes. And it'll be interesting to see the overlay uh, of, of these along with um, the, the past through entity uh, tax uh, structures as well as the um, PTE audits as well. It's, it, yep. it's, it's a multi-layered chess game. Yep. Well, that's a great way to close. Um, Lauren, let's turn it back over to you for closing thoughts. Hey, well, I just want to say thank you to the three of you for joining us today. This has been a really insightful uh, question. And anybody who is uh, listening in and has questions, you can go ahead and send them to tax product management at bna.com, and those will get routed uh, onto me to pass along to our presenters to try and get you answers to those. Uh, and as always, thank you for joining us and check out Bloomberg Tax and Accounting's 2021 Survey of State Tax Departments for a more in-depth look at some of the topics um, that we look at and how the states are treating them.